In Florida, a young woman is hit by a train. But what looks like a suicide might be a killer covering his tracks. A woman disappears from her Arizona home. With no body, police must rely on a few drops of blood to determine her fate. In California, police are called to the scene of a grisly double homicide. Only forensic examiners can prove whether it was the result of self-defense or cold-blooded murder. Some killers go to great lengths to manipulate a crime scene. But the truth is hard to disguise, and forensic examiners can see through the deception, especially when it's written in tainted blood. Around 4 a.m. on December 5, 1993, a freight train was passing through the small community of Crestview, Florida. On an isolated stretch, the engineer noticed something lying across the tracks up ahead. It looked like a human body. He frantically sounded the whistle and struggled to stop the train. Underneath the 120-ton train, he discovered the lifeless body of a woman. The engineer quickly radioed in for help. Within minutes, police and emergency personnel from the Crestview Police Department were dispatched to the scene. The young female victim had suffered massive head and chest wounds. She was partially covered by a black trench coat that was stained with blood. Police began searching for any form of identification to tell them who this woman was. They found nothing. Blood found pooled on the tracks and on some rocks just feet away from where the victim came to rest suggested the impact point. A few hairs and tiny drops of blood were found at the front of the train. But investigators found no blood smears on the tracks leading up to the victim's body. When questioned, the engineer told police that as he worked to stop the train, he believed that he made eye contact with the woman lying on the tracks. She never even flinched as the train approached. She just seemed to be staring at him. Before leaving the scene, evidence technicians photographed the area. At autopsy, the medical examiner determined the cause of death to be severe trauma to the unidentified victim's head and chest. She had suffered multiple skull fractures and a broken rib. To the medical examiner, all of the injuries were consistent with having been caused by the train. With no obvious signs of foul play noted during autopsy, investigators began looking for other explanations behind the tragedy. For Chief Maxie Barrow, there seemed to be only one. We would, were thinking that it could possibly be a suicide. It could be somebody who was depressed and laid down on the railroad track and uh, let a train run over them. To confirm their suspicions, investigators first had to identify the young woman. Several local residents believed she was 24-year-old Sherry Morrow, who lived with her husband less than a mile from the train tracks. Police went to the address. There, they were met by John Morrow, Sherry's husband, and the couple's roommate. Investigators showed the husband a photograph of the victim. John Morrow couldn't believe what he was seeing. 
The woman lying dead on the railroad tracks was his wife, Sherry. Morrow said that he and Sherry fought the night before. She believed he was flirting with another woman who was at a party at the couple's house. She became enraged. John followed her outside, determined to convince her that she was mistaken. They walked up the street to a payphone. She was cold, so John gave her his trench coat. Despite his efforts, Sherry remained angry and seemed depressed. John returned home, believing the best thing he could do would be to leave her alone. He thought that Sherry called a friend to come pick her up. John never imagined that she would take her own life. The couple's roommate corroborated John's story. The husband's account, in addition to the autopsy finding, left investigators with no reason to doubt the suicide theory. The investigation into Sherry Morrow's death was ready to be closed. The following day, however, Sherry Morrow's mother came in to speak with police. Okay, your, your daughter was married? She could not accept that her daughter had taken her own life. John, she said, had had numerous affairs that Sherry found out about. As a result, Sherry had decided to end the turbulent marriage. Recently, she had begun searching for her own place so she could be closer to her mother. And though Sherry was upset to learn of her husband's infidelities, her mother was certain that she would never have killed herself. In fact, Sherry was prepared for a costly divorce, which John desperately wanted to avoid. It's not unusual for uh, the family of a suicide victim to determine that, or to, to say that they didn't do, they didn't commit suicide. But in the case, in the case of this victim, her mother was pretty convincing to me that, uh, that, that this victim didn't do that and uh, wouldn't have done that. Despite their new suspicions, investigators found no evidence suggesting that Sherry Morrow had met with foul play. Almost a month after she was discovered along the railroad tracks, the young woman was laid to rest. Over the next several years, investigators interviewed dozens of Sherry's friends looking to uncover proof that she had been murdered. But they found nothing. The investigation into Sherry Morrow's death ground to a halt. The case was handed over to Crestview Police Lieutenant Jerome Worley. Determined to breathe new life into the investigation, he began re-interviewing the couple's friends and associates, starting with their roommate. The roommate again corroborated the story John had given two years earlier. On the night Sherry died, he said John followed her after she stormed out of the house in anger. But he returned soon after and never left the house again. Detectives sensed that the roommate wasn't telling the truth. Under threat of prosecution, he changed his story. John, he said, was sick of his wife, and he often bragged about how easy it would be to kill her and to make her death look like a suicide or an accident. He said that on the night Sherry died, John was gone for hours after leaving with her. When he returned, John was agitated. His knuckles were red. And he told the roommate, it's done. 
though the roommate's testimony confirmed investigators' suspicions that John Morrow was involved in his wife's death, Lieutenant Worley knew it wouldn't be enough to prove murder. Well, the roommate would be contradicting himself with a new statement, and it would just be his word against the husband's word in court. So we knew we'd have to have some physical evidence to prove the case. But with the victim laid to rest and little evidence recovered from the scene, finding proof of murder would not be easy. For nearly three years, police in Crestview, Florida, struggled to make sense of the death of 24-year-old Sherry Morrow. Though all of the evidence suggested she had taken her own life by lying in front of an oncoming train, investigators suspected that her husband, John Morrow, had murdered her. But they didn't have a shred of proof. Investigators forwarded what little evidence they had to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement Crime Lab in Pensacola. There, examiner Jan Johnson, an expert in bloodstain pattern interpretation, began examining photographs of the scene and the victim's clothes. Starting at the place where Sherry was struck by the train, Johnson began analyzing the bloodstains. Generally speaking, if you would have a body uh, lying on a railroad track and the, the body's still, uh, there's no movement. So therefore, when the, the train would strike the victim, you would have spatter blood at that point of impact. But in the photographs, there was no blood spatter at that spot. The blood was pooled. For Johnson, the only way to explain the findings was that Sherry was already bleeding when she laid down on the tracks. The lack of any blood smeared along the tracks leading up to Sherry's body was also troubling. If it was a train striking a woman lying on the railroad tracks, I would expect to see a trail of blood leading from the point of impact to the final resting place. In fact, no bleeding had occurred from any of the wounds caused by the train. That would only make sense if she was dead at the point of impact. Uh, once your heart stops, uh, the blood flow ceases. So therefore, any uh, injury that occurs after that fact, uh, you will have very little uh, bloodshed. But if the train hadn't killed her, the question remained, what had? To find out, Johnson began analyzing the blood stains found on the victim's clothes. She found blood spatter on the victim's t-shirt that didn't correspond to any of the head injuries noted in the original autopsy report. The size and the location of the spatter on the t-shirt was consistent with a specific type of injury. If I had not known this was a train case and just received the clothing solely alone in the laboratory, I would have clearly thought someone had been beaten uh, just by looking at the clothing because again we've got this batter pattern on the t-shirt and this would be consistent with someone being beaten, stabbed, something of that nature. Johnson passed on her findings to Crestview Police. The forensic analysis convinced detectives that Sherry Morrow had been murdered. To take this case before a jury, however, they needed to find the fatal injuries that had somehow gone unnoticed years earlier. Three years after she was laid to rest, Sherry's remains were exhumed and forwarded to the medical examiner for a second autopsy. A new medical examiner began looking for evidence of homicide. On the back of the victim's skull, he found injuries consistent with blunt force trauma. and the wounds were not consistent with any of the injuries caused by the train. Any particular wound? Medical examiner Dr. Michael Birkeland next reviewed the original autopsy photos looking for any other abnormalities. He noticed strange bruising on the victim's neck that had not been noted in the original autopsy reports. X-rays revealed the presence of a broken hyoid a bone in the neck located at the base of the tongue. Dr. Birkeland didn't believe that the train could have caused the injury. 
it would be extremely unlikely that uh, the train could have struck her in such a way to fracture the hyoid and leave the jaw intact uh, because it is such a protected structure up high in the neck, uh, back behind the jawbone. The most reasonable explanation for the broken hyoid was that Sherry Morrow had been strangled. The blunt force trauma injuries found on the skull and the broken hyoid bone gave investigators the evidence they needed to prove that Sherry Morrow had been the victim of a homicide. And though investigators suspected that her husband, John Morrow, had committed the murder, they needed to find a way to link him to the crime scene. Walking in between the tracks was this couple. Though several years had gone by, police tracked down all of the railroad engineers who had passed through the area on the night Sherry was murdered one immediately recognized photographs of John and Sherry Morrow. The couple, he said, were walking dangerously close to the tracks. They appeared to be having a bitter argument and seemed oblivious to his warnings. The engineer specifically remembered that the man, identified as John Morrow, had been wearing a black trench coat. On April 29, 1997, John Morrow was placed under arrest and charged with first-degree murder. Though he maintained his innocence, police believe that when Sherry decided to end the marriage, the stress of a divorce was too much for him to bear. As the couple argued while walking along the railroad tracks, John grabbed a blunt instrument and struck Sherry in the back of the head. But when she failed to lose consciousness, he finished the job by beating and then strangling her, breaking her hyoid bone in the process. Then he laid her bleeding body on the tracks and covered her with the blood-spattered trench coat. Sherry likely died within a few minutes. A jury convicted John Morrow of murder and sentenced him to life in prison without parole. John Morrow tried to deceive investigators by disguising his victim's cause of death. In a suburban community just north of Phoenix, Arizona, investigators would have to prove murder without the victim's body. On the evening of June 4, 1989, Maricopa County Sheriff's deputies were called to the home of Earl and Ruby Morris. The couple's daughter, Cindy, was concerned that something had happened to her 49-year-old mother, Ruby. The two had made plans to meet that day, but Ruby failed to show up. When Cindy stopped by to check on her, she found her parents' bedroom was unusually messy. and she noticed that their 22 caliber handgun was missing. Did your mom or dad do any kind of recreational shooting? Or she said that her father, right? Earl, was currently in Los Angeles, California, but he would be back early the next day. But by the following morning, neither Ruby nor her husband, Earl, had returned home. Maricopa County Sheriff's Lieutenant Lee Luganbuehl was asked to look into the case. After reviewing the daughter's statements, he agreed to open a missing persons investigation. Well, the daughter, Cindy, is supposed to meet her for lunch that day, and she never showed up. And this was kind of unusual for mom. Mom was a, a very uh, prompt person, would always meet her appointments, and she was very neat around the house also. Uh, so there were some things that were out of place at the house that was just not like Ruby. That's my fault. Later that afternoon, the detective returned to the Morris residence to interview family members. When asked about her mother and father's relationship, Cindy told police that her parents' 30-year marriage had turned ugly in recent months. What is this, Earl? Earl had been caught having an affair. Upset and angry, Ruby began threatening to end the marriage and vowed to financially ruin her husband. Earl, a successful 49-year-old accountant, promised her that would never happen. But Cindy couldn't imagine that her father was capable of physical violence. 
As the questioning continued, Earl Morris returned from his trip. Cindy commented that he wasn't driving his own car. Morris? Yes, sir. Earl explained that his car, an El Camino, had broken down some 200 miles from home on the drive back from Los Angeles. After several hours stranded on the road, he managed to hitch a ride to Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport. There, Earl said he rented a car to get home. But almost immediately, the detective was suspicious of Earl's story. I looked at his clothes and his general demeanor, too. He was neat. Uh, he didn't appear to be out, uh, you know, uh, trying to flag down a car. Uh, he was all put together. The detective also noticed new airport tags on Earl's luggage, suggesting he had flown, not driven, from California. And the luggage tags originated from San Diego, not Los Angeles. With his suspicions raised, the investigator questioned Earl about Ruby's disappearance. Though he couldn't explain why the couple's 22 caliber gun was missing, he seemed unconcerned about his wife's whereabouts. Ruby, he said, would often take off for days on end without a word. Earl told me he didn't think it was unusual uh, for Ruby to be gone uh, for a couple days, that uh, you know she had the wherewithal, credit cards, be able to go out, visit other people, and, and to leave. So he, again, was saying like it was no big deal that she was gone. Ten, four, two, Investigators felt differently. Looking to corroborate Earl's story, they began searching the interstates for his broken down El Camino. But hours of driving turned up no signs of the vehicle, and there were no records of it having been towed. An APB was issued for the car. A short while later, Earl Morris's El Camino was located. It was found nearly 400 miles away parked near the San Diego airport. San Diego authorities impounded the vehicle and arranged for it to be transported back to Arizona. All right, thanks, bye. For investigators, it was now clear that Earl Morris's story was a lie. To find out what he was hiding, they obtained a search warrant. Later that evening, police returned to his residence. Having observed no obvious signs of foul play, investigators began scouring the bedroom for trace amounts of evidence. They discovered several blood stains on the carpet near the bed. Maricopa County Sheriff's Crime Lab Supervisor James Serpa noticed something odd about their appearance. We saw visible signs that the carpet nap and the master suite had been disturbed um, in a circular pattern, which could indicate the use of a uh, carpet cleaner. Technicians also found a fine mist of blood spatter on the headboard of the couple's bed. The evidence was collected and forwarded to the crime lab for analysis. For investigators, the discovery of so much blood was not encouraging. The amount of blood in the master suite uh, was a significant amount of blood, and someone would have been uh, at least direly wounded, if not deceased. Though investigators believed that someone was Ruby Morris, they soon learned that the blood recovered from the house was too degraded for a definitive DNA analysis. Technicians began scouring Earl Morris's vehicle for clues. The search revealed the presence of several large blood stains on the passenger side carpet. The samples were collected and sent out for DNA testing. Though the analysis would take time, police speculated that Earl Morris had murdered his wife, then transported her body in his El Camino and that meant Ruby's body could be anywhere between Phoenix and San Diego. 
as investigators began the daunting task of trying to pinpoint Ruby's remains, one of the couple's daughters came forward with information. Earl owned a boat, and he kept it docked in San Diego. Believing there had to be a connection, police contacted authorities there. A few days later, San Diego Harbor Police forwarded a video cassette to Maricopa County investigators. The tape, shot the same day that Ruby was reported missing, showed a boat burning at sea. And authorities had positively identified it as belonging to Earl Morris. For detectives, the significance was clear. We speculated that Earl rented another boat to tow out his boat and actually set it on fire to hide uh, the body of, uh, of Ruby uh, and also the murder weapon at that time. The boat ultimately sank in treacherous waters too deep to be recovered. Despite the clumsy lies Earl Morris was telling police, it looked like he just might get away with murder. Detectives in Maricopa County, Arizona, were convinced that Earl Morris had murdered his 49-year-old wife, Ruby, and then entombed her in a watery grave several hundred miles away off the California coast. But without a weapon or the victim's body, they would have to rely on the forensic evidence to prove murder. And first, they would have to show that blood found in Earl's El Camino belonged to his wife. With no known samples from Ruby to compare to the evidence, examiners turned to a process called reverse paternity typing, which isolates strands of DNA that pass unchanged from mother to child. Maricopa County Sheriff's Crime Lab Supervisor James Serpa then compared the genetic profile of the samples collected from the El Camino to those generated from Ruby's two daughters and from her siblings. The blood stain on the carpet of the El Camino was the mother of Ruby's children and the sibling of Ruby's brother and sister. Though their case was largely circumstantial, investigators arrested Earl Morris and charged him with murder. Through his lawyer, Earl refused to make any statements. As the trial approached, investigators struggled to come up with more incriminating evidence against Earl Morris but they found little else. Then, word came in that Earl Morris wanted to talk. He admitted he had been lying to authorities, but he said it wasn't to cover up his wife's murder. Ruby, he said, had killed herself. Earl said that in the early morning hours of June 4th, he entered the master bedroom and found Ruby dead clutching the couple's 22 caliber pistol in her hand. Blood was everywhere. Wanting to spare the family the embarrassment of the suicide, he cleaned up the room and drove her body to San Diego, where he then disposed of the remains. He thought it would be easier for the family to accept that Ruby had decided to just up and leave. Though the account sounded ridiculous to police, they realized that Earl's suicide story had the potential to create reasonable doubt in the minds of jurors. Unless investigators could come up with hard evidence to prove otherwise, Earl Morris could be a free man. And without the ability to examine the victim's body, it would be difficult to disprove Earl's story. Lieutenant Commander Rod Englert, an expert in bloodstain pattern analysis, was brought in to assist in the investigation. Englert and Serpa began by re-examining the headboard collected from the couple's bedroom. When luminol was applied, Englert had no doubt that the blood spatter present, which appeared as fine mist, had resulted from a specific type of injury. 
Well, when there's crimes of violence, blood is categorized into three major categories. The low uh, category, which is termed low velocity impact spatters, just drops of blood, smears of blood, transfer stains. The second category is from blunt trauma, which is termed medium velocity. And the third category, which we're dealing with in this particular case, is high velocity, which is a specific, uh, easily identified uh, pattern, which is atomization of blood. And that comes from gunshot. The location of the spatter on the headboard also allowed examiners to determine the position of the victim's head at the time she was shot. Ruby had been lying flat in a sleep-like position. Though the finding was suspicious, on its own it did not contradict Earl Morris's suicide story. After thoroughly photographing the bloodstains, Englert began looking for any abnormalities in the patterns. Something immediately caught his attention. As you look at the headboard a left to right direction, you have a pattern of blood going up that direction. You have another pattern of blood over, overlapping it and going another direction. So you have there two conditions that don't occur at the same time. The blood stain patterns indicated that Ruby had been shot at least twice. And if she had taken her own life, as Earl claimed, that would have been difficult to do. Well, first of all, Ruby Morris would have to been able to cock the hammer on the gun, which I'm told was a single action revolver 22. After a shot to the head, to a large source of blood, would have to be able to cock it again, and possibly even a third time. And that's not likely. Investigators agreed. Based on the forensic analysis, there could be little doubt that Ruby Morris had been murdered. Police believe that to avoid the financial ruin from a divorce, Earl Morris chose to kill his wife. As Ruby lay sleeping in the couple's bed, he pulled out the 22 caliber pistol and shot her several times in the head. After cleaning up the crime scene, he loaded her bleeding body into his El Camino and drove several hundred miles away to San Diego. Once there, he loaded her body, and likely the murder weapon, onto his boat. He set the craft on fire returned to shore and began the process of covering up his crime. With the help of Rod Englert's blood spatter analysis, Earl Morris was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Earl Morris tried to explain his wife's death by creating a story about suicide. But sometimes murderers admit killing their victims and the story they tell investigators is one of self-defense. Around 1.30 a.m. on October 18, 1984, the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department received a frantic 911 call. 24-year-old Brett Harris said that his mother, Barbara, had been murdered. His stepfather, Bob Giesler, was also dead. Distraught, Brett was threatening to take his own life. Sacramento County Sheriff's deputies raced to the scene. As they approached the house, they made a bizarre discovery. A man, identified as Brett Harris, was hiding in a tree. After talking him down, one of the officers made his way into the residence. Come on over here. Come on out. In the master bedroom, he discovered a gruesome scene. A woman lay dead on the mattress. And on the floor nearby was another lifeless body. Officers from the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department were dispatched to the home of 52-year-old Bob Giesler 
and his 55-year-old wife, Barbara. The couple had been brutally murdered. Investigators questioned Barbara's son, Brett Harris, who had called 911. After some time, he was able to recount what had happened. Brett said that around 1.30 a.m., he heard a commotion and then a scream coming from his parents' bedroom. When he entered their room, he saw his stepfather standing above his lifeless mother. He saw an ax handle lying on the floor. As he doing? went to grab it, his stepfather then attacked him with a box cutter. Brett said he managed to overpower him and in self-defense, he beat his stepfather to death. The young man was transported to the police station. Evidence technicians made their way into the bedroom. According to crime scene unit investigator Brian Kennedy, both victims had been savagely beaten. Their heads and faces were grotesquely disfigured and uh, there were blood stains all over uh, every surface. Um, at one time, the air must have been filled with atomized mist of, of, or droplets of blood falling out of the air. It was uh, quite a, a horrendous sight. Technicians began looking for evidence to help them reconstruct what had happened inside the room. In addition to the ax handle, investigators also recovered a blood-stained box cutter found resting on Bob Giesler's chest. All of the bloodstain patterns were carefully photographed. As the search of the house continued, officers followed a trail of bloody shoe prints that led from the bedroom to the kitchen. The trail stopped in front of an opened utility drawer. Unsure what to make of the findings, officers created a visual record of the evidence. At the police station, investigators struggled to obtain coherent answers from Brett Harris. He was unresponsive to their questions and began rambling on about the devil and other things that made little sense. Officers photographed several superficial wounds on his body. Police also collected his blood-stained clothes. With so many unanswered questions, police hoped autopsies of the victims could tell them more. The medical examiner concluded that Bob and Barbara Giesler had both died from massive blunt force trauma to the skull. The beatings had been so savage that both the victims' arms had been broken while defending themselves during the assaults. Special Assistant Attorney General David Drewliner followed the investigation. For him, the autopsy findings were troubling. The viciousness with which the uh, two individuals were killed, uh, Harris's mother and his stepfather, um, was very extremely similar. And so had, had the stepfather been the killer of, the, of his own wife, and then Harris been the killer of the stepfather, you wouldn't have expected necessarily it to have been uh, in such an identical manner. Authorities couldn't ignore the possibility that one person had committed both murders. If Brett Harris was responsible for the vicious double homicide, Investigators needed to find out what could have motivated such rage. They turned to family members for information. Brett's stepsister told detectives that her stepmother and father had always maintained a good relationship with Brett. Though Brett would sometimes find himself facing legal problems, his mother and stepfather would always look out for him, bailing him out of jail on a number of occasions. Brett's stepfather even employed him at his tool-making company, 
in hopes that the young man would find himself. Though Brett suffered from a psychiatric condition, his stepsister said that he had made progress in recent months. And with the help of medications, his prospects for the future were promising. She added that Bob and Barbara's relationship was strong, and she could not imagine that her father would ever hurt her stepmother. Nothing investigators had learned jibed with Brett Harris's version of events. Believing the 24-year-old was hiding something, they turned to examiners at the Sacramento County Sheriff's Crime Lab for answers. There, examiner Brian Kennedy looked to the blood evidence to help him reconstruct the crime. This was an interesting case where we had three people in a house where only one person came out alive, and he had a story. The story was not completely and totally uh, impossible. In piecing it all together, um, I tried to support his story. I actually looked at it to see uh, if I could prove him correct. But in one of the photographs taken in the bedroom, Kennedy noticed something odd. Though the entire room had been saturated with the victim's blood, the carpet underneath the stepfather's body was clean. For Kennedy, there seemed to be only one way to explain that fact. He goes down onto the floor, and he's incapacitated and shields the floor from any blood that would come from his wife. And so we know that he's down first because she's then attacked and her blood covers the rest of the room. And we can, we can put her blood on top of him, but we can't put it underneath him. The finding contradicted Brett's story that his mother had already been bludgeoned and was bleeding by the time he entered the room. With the evidence now pointing to Brett Harris as his mother's killer, Kennedy began analyzing bloodstains on his clothing for proof. But serological tests showed that all the blood on his clothes had originated from the stepfather. Kennedy now wondered if it was possible for Brett to have bludgeoned his mother while avoiding getting her blood on him. To find out, he devised a blood spatter experiment. Simulating the assailant's position, he began striking sponges soaked with blood with a wooden instrument, looking to see how the resulting blood spatter would stain his clothing. The result surprised him. The first couple blows, I actually turned my head to the side of, you know, so I wouldn't get a full face of spatter. And I found out I wasn't getting anything. I just started um, relaxing and letting, letting it go. I started beating it even harder. And it was all going out to the sides. Very little was coming back at me, if any. Kennedy had successfully demonstrated that Barbara's assailant could have avoided being spattered by her blood. We have a lot of that we're get, and coupled uh, with the other findings, the it was clear that Brett Harris's story was a lie. So the bottom line is the two deceased people who couldn't speak for themselves spoke volumes with the bloodstain patterns that were produced from them. And I was unable to support or substantiate anything that the defendant had said. After being charged with two counts of first degree murder, Brett Harris underwent a psychiatric evaluation. He now admitted to both killings, but claimed it was in self-defense. After explaining that his parents were possessed by warlocks, Brett Harris entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. Though Brett had been previously diagnosed with a mental condition, prosecutors believed the story he was now telling was just a desperate attempt to escape justice.
He wasn't insane. Uh, and by that I mean, uh, did he know what he was doing? Did he know that he actually was killing human beings? And did he know that it was wrong? Uh, and there is no doubt as to the answer to those questions was yes and yes. He knew it was wrong, otherwise, why did he call 911 immediately after it? He knew it was a crime. But to win a murder conviction, Get authorities out. needed to find yeah. physical proof that the cold-blooded murders were not the result of an insane mind. Forensic examiners in Sacramento, California, had proven that 24-year-old Brett Harris had brutally bludgeoned his mother and stepfather to death. After being charged with two counts of first-degree murder, the suspect told psychiatrists that warlocks possessed both Bob and Barbara Giesler and he killed the couple in self-defense. Brett Harris entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. To prove that he was lying in order to avoid the death penalty, authorities turned once again to the forensic evidence. Examiner Brian Kennedy began looking at all the physical evidence recovered from the crime scene looking for anything that could demonstrate that Brett Harris knew what he was doing at the time of the murders. He focused on the box cutter found on Bob Giesler's chest. After reviewing the autopsy reports, Kennedy believed it was unlikely that the box cutter could have been used as a weapon against Brett, as he had previously claimed. Both of our, our victims had broken arms. If you're defending yourself with your arms and you've got a holding something and it's severe enough to break the arm you're going to lose control of whatever is in your hand most likely i doubt seriously you can hang on to it for somebody to have their arm broken and then place it on their chest is not likely believing that brett harris had staged the crime scene to throw investigators off his trail Kennedy next looked for a way to explain the box cutter wounds found on his body. This looks like somebody has self-inflicted these injuries because they're in the right place for a right-handed person to cut himself on the left arm, to cut himself on the right cheek, to cut himself from left to right across his chest. So it's all very consistent with staging his own injuries. The forensic findings provided irrefutable proof that Brett Harris had gone to great lengths to conceal his guilt. And for prosecutors, those are not the actions of an insane man. He physically changed the crime scene in anticipation that the police are coming to the crime scene. So he tries to fool law enforcement. Why do it? Why come up with any sort of explanation? He wouldn't have to. Though unsure of the motive, police believe that on October 18, 1984, Brett Harris snuck into the couple's room as they slept in their bed. Using an axe handle, he bludgeoned Bob and Barbara Giesler to death. After finishing the kill, he made his way into the kitchen, sliced himself with a box cutter he took from the utility drawer, and returned to the bedroom to plant the evidence. Confronted with the evidence, Brett Harris withdrew his insanity defense. He pled guilty to one count of first-degree murder and one count of second-degree murder. He was sentenced to 41 years to life. Killers skilled at the art of deception hope to confuse investigators by manipulating a crime scene. But forensic experts can find justice for victims of homicide by seeing through a murderer's lies, which are written in tainted blood. Becky! Rebecca? Investigators find a clue they think will lead to a killer's front door, but instead find themselves heading down a blind alley. Now, their most important evidence is withering before their eyes. When a man reports his wife missing, her abandoned car becomes the biggest clue. 
but it's the nosy neighbors who drive the investigation. Four months into her marriage, a woman disappears. But when her body turns up, it's clear she was no runaway bride. Investigators must rely on flimsy evidence to bag her killer. For some lovers, marriage can be murder. Even though proving it may pose a challenge, killers can't divorce themselves from the consequences of their broken vows. morning hours of December 28, 1995, Melinda and David McLean let themselves Becky! into the apartment of their sister-in-law, Becky Vargas. The telephone and electricity in her unit hadn't been switched on yet. Rebecca? Becky was separating from her husband and had just rented the Ogden, Utah apartment. Becky? She had told her husband, Stephen Vargas, that she was going to try to start organizing her belongings and would return in an hour or two. But that was several hours ago. Stephen had asked Melinda and David to check on her, since they lived nearby. Melinda, who was Stephen's sister and Becky's best friend, was glad to go. Though they didn't see Becky, all seemed quiet and safe. leaving them unprepared for what they found. Becky Vargas lay dead in the leaves outside the building. Even before the sun was up, the Weber County, Utah Crime Scene Investigation Unit began its day processing the murder scene. The victim's blouse had been pulled up. At first glance, the condition of her clothes made her appear to be the victim of a random sexual homicide. But a closer look revealed the story was not so simple. Criminalist Russ Dean thought the scene might have been staged. It was as if her body had been moved from one location to another. Uh, her arm was under her body as if she'd been dragged. Her coat was removed and was under her body. The leaves were bunched up in certain locations around her arms and legs. And there was no other obvious indication of any type of sexual assault. In fact, though the victim had suffered a head injury, most of the blood had pooled at her feet, suggesting she'd been turned around. Whoever did this had apparently tried to throw off the investigators. The forensics team documented and collected a set of car keys, a cigarette lighter, fragments of blood-spattered leaves, and most significantly, the apparent murder weapon, a broken flashlight stained with blood and entangled with hair. They spent six hours sifting through every inch of the area before they were satisfied. They determined that although the body had been repositioned, the victim hadn't been moved far. The only blood found was just a few inches from where she lay. Because the blood-stained flashlight was the most compelling clue, it was analyzed first at the Utah State Crime Lab in Salt Lake City. Investigators could see that it had a partial fingerprint on it, stamped in blood. According to latent print examiner Scott Spute, a bloody fingerprint can be even better than a smoking gun. 
when we have a bloody fingerprint, for example, it's the victim's blood, it's not her finger, it's someone else's finger on the evidence, it's a crucial pinpointing item of evidence in which we can identify someone being at that crime scene, leaving that bloody fingerprint behind at the scene as they left. It would be bad practice to home in on that one print. The lab had to inspect the flashlight for additional prints. The obvious ones and the ones that remained invisible. It required two separate processes. Blood stains, because they're not oily, can flake or rub off. To fix them in place, the flashlight was heated to 100 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes. After I heat it on, I then put a, a stain on there, which is called a metal black, which reacts to the blood and makes it very visible and oftentimes brings out areas of blood that were invisible prior to treatment. To develop the latent or unseen prints, the flashlight was exposed to super glue vapor. The adhesive bonds to the moisture on the print, creating a durable shell that exposes and preserves it. Then, a fluorescent dye is applied, which adheres to the super glue. The latent prints shine under ultraviolet light. Testing revealed no other blood-stained prints. The original one, along with the latent prints, would have to do. Once a suspect was isolated, investigators were confident that the bloody fingerprint was all they'd need. While the clues were being scrutinized, Melinda McLean and her husband David went to the police station to give their statements. Melinda told police that she'd been best friends with Becky Vargas for 14 years. And then, and then we went back. Becky had been married to her brother, Stephen Vargas, for nine of them, but it looked like their marriage was coming to an end. As far as she knew, the split was amicable. Though Becky was having an affair that her husband, Stephen Vargas, may have suspected, there didn't seem to be a lot of tension between the couple. In fact, it was Stephen who had called the McLeans to look in on her after the police told him they had no officers available to check on his wife. David McLean, down the hall, told police a similar story. He said that Stephen Vargas had called him just before 11 p.m. the night before the murder. Uh, did Steve at all go over there? Stephen was worried because she was away so long, and the apartment had no lights. He said that he and Melinda stopped by. Though Becky's car was in the driveway, there was no answer. They went to a window to see if everything was okay, but stopped when they heard moaning. They thought that perhaps her boyfriend was there, so they left. They went to a payphone to tell Stephen that everything was fine. They told him what they had heard, then they left. David told police that out of curiosity, they drove back to Becky's a short time later. Now they were surprised to see Stephen Vargas's Jeep parked out front. Soon he appeared from beside the building, got into the vehicle, and drove off. David said that they caught up with him. Stephen was wearing his bathrobe and slippers. He told them he wanted to check on Becky himself, but asked the McLeans not to tell anyone he was there. When David revealed this detail to the police, Melinda reluctantly admitted it was true. David told police that Stephen called them once more early the following morning. He said that Becky still wasn't home and asked them to check on her again. That's when they found her dead.
At autopsy, the medical examiner determined that the lantern found at the scene wasn't the actual murder weapon, but it may have been used to subdue the victim. From the shape of the wound, she was apparently struck down with a hammer or something similar. No such object was located. The killer was clever enough to carry off or remove some of the most incriminating evidence. Authorities hoped he'd left enough behind. At the police station, investigators continued to talk with the McLeans. Their detailed story seemed to pivot on Stephen Vargas. Then it took a more provocative twist when the police dispatcher told Detective David Wheeloth that Vargas was on the phone, but he wasn't calling about his wife. She said that he was on the phone inquiring about his sister and his brother-in-law and if they were in fact at the police station. And I told the dispatcher, yeah, that's who we're, we're in here talking to. And if she would ask him if he would mind coming down to the police station as well. Separation. Police told him about um, Becky's murder and said that his in-laws were fine. Yeah, I was aware of. But he might not and, be and because Belinda and David She's saw a, him at the murder scene. Loved a lot. I, I, he admitted that he was there that night, just as the McLeans had said. He peeked in the window, but he heard and saw nothing. Because the window was right next to where the victim was found, Wheeloth didn't believe him. If Steve had gone there to look and listen, uh, I don't think it would have been likely that he would have not seen Becky lying just a few feet away. His suspicious behavior and the eyewitness testimony by the McLeans was enough to get a warrant to search Stephen Vargas's Jeep and to collect his fingerprints and a blood sample. Can you get a, uh, can you get a paper bag? Investigators were after anything that could link him to the crime scene. They found nothing but minuscule fragments of leaves, and not even many of those. Actually, I wish I could find my little The Jeep looked recently vacuumed. They collected what they could, then returned the vehicle to Vargas and sent him home. The forensics team hoped they wouldn't need to rely on the leaves. Now that they had Vargas's fingerprint, they could compare it to the ones from the flashlight. Most of the prints did, in fact, match Stephen Vargas. But that made sense. He owned it. So the only one that really mattered was the one stamped in blood. The bloody fingerprint had a shape called a tented arch. Of the three features of fingerprints, loops, arches and whorls. Arches are the least common. And tented arches are rarer still. Only 5% of the population has them. Stephen Vargas was among that group. But the fingerprint on the flashlight wasn't clear enough to make a definitive comparison. Vargas might have left it, and then again, Maybe not. I cannot say he did not leave that print behind. I can only say it's not enough to identify it positively. They thought the flashlight would illuminate the killer. Without it, their hopes of solving the case looked considerably more dim. Investigators working to solve the Becky Vargas homicide saw their most promising piece of evidence rendered useless. According to Detective Wheeloth, a case that had looked cut and dried now depended on very fragile clues. After we lost the flashlight, uh, about the last piece of, of physical evidence we had that we could try and do anything with were the leaf fragments that were recovered out of the Jeep. If investigators could find specks of blood on the tiny fragments, they would support the idea that Stephen Vargas was close enough to the body to have tracked them into his Jeep. It fell to supervising criminalist Pilar Shortsleeve to analyze the minuscule samples. Trying to see blood on a small piece of 
colorful leaf was difficult. So we used a stereo zoom so we could get down and look very closely at the leaves and then um, to kind of guesstimate if we had any stains and then we would do some preliminary tests. Well, Out of the five samples of leaves, enough? Pilar Shortsleeve found traces of blood on two. But she had no proof the blood was the victim's. She rushed the samples to a DNA lab for analysis, fearing it might already be too late. Whenever um, blood or body fluids are left on soil or, or samples that contain a lot of possible bacteria, the bacteria begin immediately in destroying the sample. Um, they destroy not only the cells, but they get into the DNA and start to break the DNA down. It would take three months for the results to come back from the lab. Investigators had to bide their time, but they didn't do it idly. They had to assume that the results would be negative and began to build their case some other way. Police served a warrant to search Vargas's apartment. were after the bathrobe and slippers he was seen wearing at the crime scene. If he had beaten his wife to death, surely they'd be blood spattered. Vargas left the clothes in plain sight, easy to find. He was supposed to be wearing a bathrobe and a pair of slippers. The bathrobe had been freshly laundered. The slippers had no trace of debris on them. That in itself was strange, considering he admitted walking outdoors in them. It seemed like uh, Stephen Vargas was one step ahead of us on getting rid of any physical evidence that might link him to the crime scene. Uh, it seemed like every step that we thought of to locate that evidence was foiled. Robert? Yeah. But there was one clue he couldn't bury because it was 375 miles away in Cheyenne, Wyoming. After several weeks of wrestling with his conscience, Vargas's half-brother, Robert Esquivel, called police to tell of a favor that Stephen had asked before Becky's murder. Steve had asked him if he would come out here and kill Becky for him. Police set up a phone tap in Esquivel's apartment and had him call Vargas to get him to talk about their previous conversation. Steve had gone through this, this denying or not remembering that part of their conversation, that it had been a joke, and towards the end even got threatening. Though it stopped short of a confession, Vargas had said enough for police to arrest him on January 11, 1996, for the murder of Becky Vargas. But they weren't sure they had enough evidence to convict him. One month later, the results of the DNA test on the blood-spattered leaves found in Stephen Vargas's Jeep came through. A comparison of the DNA from the blood on the leaves matched Becky Vargas's DNA. The blood on the blood fragments matched Rebecca Vargas. Now yes. authorities were confident of a conviction. No. Where, where are you going? Based on the evidence, police put together a likely scenario. Stephen Vargas, angry with his wife for her infidelity and their upcoming divorce, confronted her at her new apartment. They fought. Don't you dare! You're being a bad mother, don't you? It escalated. I'm not a good mother because you know that I am. I'm not going to let you leave me in the kitchen. And he hit her with the flashlight, knocking her out. He moved her to the side of the house, thinking she was dead. He was wrong. He wanted someone else to find the body, so he asked the McLeans to check up on her. They mistook her death throes for the throes of passion. When they told Stephen, he returned to finish what he'd begun, using a more lethal weapon. Tiny fragments of leaves told the whole story. Well, in this case in particular, we had this flashlight that had a possible fingerprint in it, in blood. And that would have been the piece of evidence that kind of closed all the loose ends. But it didn't happen. In this case, it was a very small piece of leaf that was found in a vehicle that had blood on it that came from the victim. And it was just the 
interesting and exciting part that something so small could be so integral in a case. Stephen Vargas was convicted of first degree murder and is now serving 20 years to life. The case of Becky Vargas began with the discovery of her body. But when a person just disappears, it's not clear that a crime has even been committed. In this story, the names of the victim and the killer have been changed. On the morning of July 31st, 1987, Dan Remington of San Diego, California, was taking his kids to the YMCA. En route, he noticed his wife's abandoned car on the side of the road. Not wanting to alarm his children, he dropped them off at daycare, then rushed home to call the police. San Diego police dispatched an officer. On his way to Remington's house, he stopped to examine the vehicle. The car apparently had a flat tire. The doors were locked and he could see no spare, nor any sign of 29-year-old Liz Remington. When the officer arrived at the Remington's home, Dan Remington told him that he last saw his wife at 10.30 the previous night when she left for work. About 10.30 last night, she's gonna go and get ready to go for work. All of after he saw her car at 7.30, he called the hospital where she was a maternity nurse, but she hadn't shown up. Remington admitted that their 12-year marriage was rocky. They were discussing divorce, but hadn't filed the papers yet. I called around and changed a couple of things. You have to by chance have a key for the vehicle? Dan handed the officer a key to the car and granted permission to impound it in search of clues. While it was possible that Liz's disappearance could be logically explained, missing persons cases fell under the domain of the homicide unit. They had the skills to collect and preserve every piece of potential evidence found at the scene. Check the spare yet. They found nothing obvious to indicate foul play and towed the car to the police garage. Any overlooked clues would be preserved in case the car required a closer look. Detectives visited a nearby convenience store, thinking that Liz might have gone there after her tire went flat. The clerk told them that she had been in the night before. She needed to break a $20 bill to make a phone call. He didn't know who she called. Police remembered that Dan Remington told them she hadn't called home. It seemed reasonable to believe she may have simply run off with someone else. Liz's sister told police that was inconceivable. She wasn't the kind of woman who run from a failing marriage. No matter how bad things became, she'd never leave her children. Sergeant Dennis Brugos of the San Diego Metro Task Force found that was the consensus. She was very devoted to her children and her family. She helped at school, she helped at Little League, and uh, just not the type of woman that would ever walk away from her family. Liz's sister told police it was strange that the spare tire was missing. Dan had changed the oil two weeks earlier and made a point of thoroughly checking the car, including the spare. 
investigators took statements from the Remington's neighbors. Many spoke of the deteriorating relationship between Liz and Dan. The information was duly noted, but in terms of evidence that any crime had been committed, investigators had absolutely nothing. At the time of Liz Remington's disappearance, San Diego police were grappling with an apparent serial killer. Because there was no evidence that Remington had left against her will, these more violent crimes took priority. There was no body, there was no weapon, and therefore she was simply one of many missing adults throughout this county. And at that particular time, there was actually a series uh, of sorts that was going on where there was upwards of 40 women whose who were found murdered uh, in the East County area. So certainly that would have precedent over a missing person. Four years passed since Liz Remington's disappearance. Most of the murdered women were transients or prostitutes, so she was not considered one of the killer's victims. But when a task force was formed to look into the serial killings, her file came up too, and investigators realized she was still missing after all this time. The neighbors taped statements and the detective reports were dusted off. Well before Liz's disappearance, they had kept a close eye on the Remingtons and helped Liz out whenever they could. Over time, friction between the couple increased and neighbors grew concerned about her and the children. One even kept a log of what went on at the house after Liz disappeared. To demonstrate how the Remington's relationship had deteriorated, a neighbor told investigators about how Dan tried to sell Liz's car without her permission. According to the neighbor, Liz wasn't just surprised, she was furious. A huge fight ensued. He said that the only reason Dan didn't sell the vehicle was because Liz had the only key and wouldn't give it to him. But police recalled that on the day Liz disappeared, Dan had the key to her vehicle in his possession. Police also learned that neighbors had reported seeing Dan Remington filling in a ravine at the back of his property with a bulldozer shortly after Liz's disappearance. They said that after her disappearance, they saw him visit that part of the property every few days. He never ventured back there before she disappeared. Remarkably, because the case had never been officially closed, Liz's car had remained impounded all this time. Dan had sued to get it released, but lost. Technically, it was still considered evidence. Now it would be looked at more thoroughly. One of the first things investigators found were coins in the ashtray. Purportedly, Liz had been last seen by a convenience store clerk when she wanted change to make a phone call. Clerk's statement suggested she was okay. Now investigators weren't so certain since she had ample change in her car. They contacted the clerk to interview him again. That clerk at the convenience store uh, actually said he wasn't real sure that it was her. So that helped us to establish the fact that we didn't really know for sure whether she was there. Suspicions of foul play had been aroused. Rugos wondered if the flat tire could have been staged. He sent the flattened tire from Liz's car to Goodyear Tire and Rubber in Akron, Ohio. Their lab is designed to evaluate the causes of tire failure. Here, 
The tire was examined on the rim. Report was the tire was flat, is still flat. Investigators found no outward signs of damage, only a tiny puncture, which would have led to slow deflation. Once the leak was isolated, Product analysis manager Chester Patterson took the tire off its mount and examined it more thoroughly. From the looks of it, the tire went flat after the car had stopped. We saw no damage on this tire. We saw no reason to have alerted any driver in the vehicle that something was going soft or, or whether the tire was deflating. Because in order to do that, you, the tire is beginning to come apart and you would see that damage on the tire itself, and we saw no such damage. But he did see something he'd never seen in his 35 years experience. The tire removed from Liz Remington's car had been punctured from the inside out. tire has been punctured from the inside. See these two impressions, circular impressions, right under the punctures of the tire. And we noticed the rust that's contained in them. And it told me that somebody had taken a nail and pounded it through the inside of the tire to cause that circular nail head impressions on the liner itself. He concluded that the tire had definitely been tampered with. Four years after Liz Remington's disappearance, investigators had enough to get a warrant to search Dan Remington's house. They found nothing of significance inside. Outside, a exactly whole different story. In the yard, a police backhoe went to work excavating the filled in ravine. Uh, the backhoe was probably two or three hours into the job when it hooked onto a piece of chain link fence that was lying flat. Uh, the excavation slowed down. What we found underneath that chain link fence was a tire. The tire was the missing tire from Liz's car. And underneath that tire, wrapped in sheets and blankets, was the body of a female. And a missing persons investigation became a murder case. Dan Remington was arrested and taken away. Officially, the body was considered a Jane Doe until a positive ID could be made. A forensic anthropologist determined the remains were those of a Caucasian female who had died of blunt trauma to the head. She had been in her late 20s to early 30s about the same height as Liz Remington. It seemed like they had found what they were looking for, but the law required more proof than that. Forensic dentist Norman Sperber was called in. Everything hinged on the teeth. Teeth are the most durable part of the body, and we fortunately had dental films from her dentist we were able to take films of her teeth because they were in very good condition. By comparing the shape and position of the victim's fillings and teeth with Liz Remington's dental records, Sperber was able to make a positive ID. Liz Remington had been found. Because the victim was discovered wrapped in bed linens, Investigators believe that Dan killed her while she was napping before work. Afterward, he carried the body out to the ravine, buried it in a shallow grave, then rented the earth-moving equipment a short time later, piling on 8 to 12 feet of dirt. Then he drove to the scene and replaced the good tire with the one he had flattened. Next morning, he reported his wife missing, confident the police would never piece it together. 
His unwitting accomplice was a suspected serial killer who demanded all of the police department's resources. But the clues eventually resurfaced, exposing the crime. Though Remington's exact motive will never be known, authorities believe he couldn't bear the shame of divorce or the fact that he'd lose half of his wealth and property. In October 1992, Dan Remington was found guilty of the first-degree murder of his wife. He was sentenced to life without parole. Remington went to a great deal of trouble to hide his crime. Others take an easier approach, which sometimes makes their crimes harder to solve. On September 21st, 1995, a body was discovered in a wooded area in Boise, Idaho. Plastic bags bound with duct tape encased the feet and head. From its state of decay, it had obviously been there several days. No ID was found. No attempt had been made to conceal the body. It appeared to have been hurriedly dumped there. Because of its position and wrappings, investigators couldn't even determine the victim's gender without disturbing an already disturbing scene. At this point, anything could be a clue so the body wasn't unwrapped or inspected until it got to the morgue, where it was scrutinized under controlled conditions. Okay. The tape was carefully cut away, and the bags removed and preserved. The victim was female, around 60 years old. The coroner determined that she was strangled, she was most likely killed elsewhere, wrapped up, and transported to the woods where she was found. She fit the description of Wanda Kuzmachev, reported missing six days earlier. Wanda had been reported missing by her second husband, Ben Kuzmachev, when she failed to return from work. The couple had been married just four months. Both had retired from the large firm they worked for. Wanda took a job cleaning offices. You are beautiful. Thank you. Ben, a Russian immigrant who had once been artistic director for the Idaho Ballet, now worked for a security company. After Ben reported her missing, detectives wondered if Wanda had had second thoughts about her second marriage and simply run off. But a check of her jewelry and possessions showed she'd taken nothing with her. That's never a good sign. And then her body turned up. The victim's car had not been found, so the bags she was wrapped in became the most important clue. Criminalist Cynthia Hill set to work examining them. It was all she had. Well, in this case, we didn't have a murder weapon. There were no eyewitnesses. And the place where Wanda was found was not the murder scene. So all these things were playing against us. Hill fumed the bags in superglue to bring out any fingerprints. The glue, contained in foil pouches, vaporizes and bonds to the print, preserving it. The print can then be dusted with powder to make it more visible. Then photographed to create a record. Hill found only one print on the bag around the victim's legs, but so far she had no one to compare it with. 
Ben Kuzmichev was called to the police station to provide a set of prints for comparison. In a murder investigation, it's standard procedure to get a spouse's prints. Have you ever been before? No, sir. Let me do all the work, okay? Usually, it eliminates the spouse as a suspect. In this case, that isn't quite how it worked out. I keep this. The print on the bag matched Ben's. That didn't necessarily mean he'd had a hand in his wife's murder. If the bag had been taken from the victim's own car, Ben might have handled it prior to its use in the crime. The print was lifted from a portion of the bag where one would normally grab it. In terms of evidence, it wasn't enough. These people are living together. They're touching objects that one another uh, touch. Um, you have to be able to find a fingerprint in a location where they wouldn't normally have touched, or it's in conjunction with another piece of evidence that puts them um, at the scene. Hill still believed that the bags might contain more prints. Though she didn't have the technology to lift them, she knew that the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Crime Lab did. If prints were there, the Mounties could find them, or so she hoped. She carefully packed her bags, sent them to Canada, and awaited the results. While Cynthia Hill waited for her prints to come from Canada, investigators in Idaho found Wanda Kuzmachev's car. More than a week had passed since her body was discovered. The vehicle had been abandoned in a store parking lot four miles from where she was found. Police processed the vehicle for fingerprints. They raised two prints from the trunk lid. Their placement suggested they were left by the person closing the trunk. Inside, investigators found something surprising nothing at all. For Detective David Smith of the Boise, Idaho Police Department, that was a significant discovery. In talking with the family members, they said that she would always carry her Jehovah Witness literature in the trunk. In fact, they said you could not put anything in her trunk because it was so full. But the trunk wasn't entirely empty. Investigators found a single drop of blood. It belonged to the victim. Whoever had put her in the trunk had also left fingerprints on the gear shift knob. Prints on the trunk and on the gear shift matched Ben Kuzmichev. Investigators faced the same challenges as before. The car belonged to Ben's wife. It stood to reason that he could leave his fingerprints on it. Still, it seemed strange that his were the only clear prints found, especially since he told police that as far as he knew, Wanda was the last person to drive the vehicle. The evidence suggested that Ben drove it last, leaving behind the clearest prints. Tests were conducted to show that in approximately 70% of all cases, the last person who drives the car and, and activates the gear shift lever will destroy the person's prints who drove the car prior to and leave their prints on the gear shift lever. The prints made detectives 70% sure that Ben Kuzmichev was lying. That wasn't good enough. An inspection of the car seat disclosed another clue. I knew Wanda's stature in that she was five foot four and 140 pounds. When I looked at the seat, it appeared to me to be back farther than usual for a woman of that stature to be driving the vehicle. So I placed a female of five foot four, 140 pounds inside the vehicle. She was unable to reach the pedals, which appeared to be a comfortable driving position. Conversely, I put a male matching Ben's description, 5'11", 190 pounds into the driver's seat, and they fit very comfortable. The experiment provided more circumstantial proof that Ben was a liar, but it still didn't prove he was a murderer. By now, the Canadian Royal Mounted Police Lab had performed their tests on the trash bag used to wrap the body of Wanda Kuzmichev. The test, called vacuum metal deposition, is a state-of-the-art method for lifting difficult prints from plastic. 
The bag was placed in a vacuum chamber and then pelted with ions of gold, which cling to the plastic, but not to the oily prints. Then it's exposed to ionized zinc, which clings only to the gold, leaving the prints untouched and in contrast against the plastic. The process revealed a second print on the bag. According to Cynthia Hill, the position of this print was far more incriminating. The second uh, fingerprint that was developed using the vacuum metal deposition proved that he had a direct contact with that bag because the positioning of the hand was in such a way that he would be grabbing the plastic bag, wrapping the tape around Wanda, and he would be the only one that would be leaving the fingerprint in that position at that time. In most cases, that would be enough to win a conviction. But investigators weren't so sure. Proving a spousal murder on fingerprints alone would be a hard sell. The prints and other evidence they'd gathered gave them enough to get a search warrant for the Kuzmichev's home. They found no signs that this was the murder scene. But they did find the Jehovah's Witness literature that the victim's family said she never removed from her car. The items presented more circumstantial evidence that Ben had been involved in the murder. By January 1996, four months after the crime, investigators were still building their case against Ben Kuzmichev. Detective. He began to feel the circle of evidence closing in on him, and he announced he was going back to Russia. At that point, police had no choice but to charge him with Wanda's murder. If he returned to Russia, he'd be a free man beyond U.S. extradition. Though they had enough to arrest him, they weren't certain they had a solid case for murder in the first. Between the time of his arrest and the trial date, investigators continued to gather evidence against Kuzmichev. Under surveillance in jail, he couldn't make a move without authorities knowing about it. We placed monitoring devices on approximately 17 phones inside the jail at the Ada County Jail. Now, that gave us the ability to monitor his conversations as outgoing as well as whoever he was seeing as a visitor. Uh, the end result was that uh, we received nothing uh, that could be used in court. The, nothing incriminating came about the phone calls. But help came from an unlikely source. Kuzmichev had confided details of his crime to his cellmate. The prisoner, disturbed by Kuzmichev's lack of remorse, reported the details to authorities. He had nothing to gain by doing so. Ben and his cellmate were watching TV one evening when the news media broadcast that we had located a witness who had told us that she had, in fact, sold Ben duct tape and trash bags. The inmate told us that Ben found this humorous, that he had, in fact, purchased from this lady, but they were not the ones that we were looking for that he used in the crime. The inmate's information, though hearsay, provided one more strike against Ben Kuzmichev. Investigators realized they'd gathered all they were going to get. They weren't sure they had enough. But because Ben was likely to be released and flee to Russia, they had to take the case to trial. From what police could put together, four months after their marriage, Ben and Wanda's honeymoon was over. He had been dependent on her money, but wanted to return to his homeland. She refused to go. Their animosity built, and Ben strangled her. He wrapped her body in plastic bags, emptied the trunk of her car, loaded her in, and dumped her in the woods. Then he abandoned the car in the parking lot. Based on the accumulated evidence, Ben Kuzmichev was convicted for the second degree murder of his wife, Wanda, and sentenced to 21 years to life. For Detective David Smith, solving this case meant more than simply delivering justice. 
you do become personally involved. I mean, this guy has come into to your town, committed this heinous act, and now you have this grieving family that you want to do everything in your power to solve this case for. And that's how I personally take it, and I know any other seasoned uh, homicide detective will tell you the same thing. When spouse kills spouse, the clues are sometimes difficult to read, but the marriage of forensic science with good detective work can bring together what the killer had tried to put asunder.